a brief of the Ten Commandments. Have thou no other gods but me, unto no image bow thy knee. Take not the name of God in vain, nor Sabbath day do thou profane. Honor thy father and mother too, and see that thou no murder do. From whoredom keep thee pure and clean, and steal not though thy state be mean. See that thou no false witness bear, and covet not thy neighbor's gear. O Lord, our souls to thee convert, and write thy laws into our heart. Hello and welcome to a new video from Jörg, Joggler 66, Hour of the Truth. Today on the 19th of November 2017 I've come to the table to read to you the next part which must, uh, if I counted correctly, be the 13th part of the book reading of my Martin Luther against the Roman papacy, an institution of the devil. And um, I want to start with a little bit of an explanation of uh, a little bit more background on why am I reading this book. Uh, yesterday on the Sabbath I have had a Bible study with uh, Brett Norman and Tom Fress from Inquisition Update, as you probably know him. And we were speaking about this book because he and I, we are reading this book almost simultaneously. That's something that you do not probably know because when I upload these videos his reading is probably more or less done a little bit because he does, of course, in First Amendment Radio, a broadcast every day, and uh, about 50 minutes of his reading and discussion is published every day, and I do not publish every day a video of this reading, because I also have other videos to upload on my channel, of course. But I want to make sure that everybody understands the right motivation, how it comes that Tom Fress from First Amendment Radio, Inquisition Update, on the one hand, and me from... 66 hour of the truth on the other hand almost read these books simultaneously just that there is a good understanding of everybody who listens to this I am not parroting what Tom says and Tom is not parroting what I say and we didn't even uh, make an appointment of reading this book uh, at the same time or what it is just the way the Holy Spirit works it is um, about a year ago in the time that I was with uh, Brett Norman and we were looking for pictures of uh, All Roads Lead to Rome, the book I read on my channel, because he was providing all the pictures to my readings, Brett, that is, um, that uh, we were speaking about this, uh, about this book, because there is on page 363 a uh, excerpt on that page that I'm not going to read right now, um, that I got to got acquainted with in one or another way via the internet. I don't know if I found that quote in a picture search, if I found that uh, quote in a, um, in a video that I watched. or I, I, I just don't know. So I, I wanted to have this book against the Roman papacy and institution of the devil. And I couldn't find that in English. And therefore I ordered it in German. And then I read it in German uh, completely and uploaded that on my channel on the month of October 2017. And uh, in that time, Tom was busy reading uh, the Babylonian captivity of Martin Luther because he also found it very important that in the 500th anniversary, or for the 500th anniversary of Reformation Day in 2017, it was important to get a lot of Martin Luther's uh, views out there. And he, of course, prepared also in this book. So. Uh, Brett Norman found this book, Luther's Works, Volume 41, and uh, found in there this book against the Roman papacy, an institution of the devil that Martin Luther wrote in 1545. And then he ordered that book uh, for me and for Tom, and he sent it to me and he sent it to Tom, uh, just to have it. And so that Tom comes to the conclusion to read that book on First Amendment Radio and I come to the conclusion to read that book on um, on my Hour of the Truth on my YouTube channel, Jogler66. These decisions have been made absolutely independently from each other. Okay, But as well as Tom, as I, we both think that 
it is very important for once to, or at least for once, to read books from the reformers themselves to understand their point of views. And also, and that is something that comes clear to you when you watch uh, Tom Fress uh, analyzing the Babylonian captivity of the church from Martin Luther, which he wrote in 1520, and the playlist is included in the description box of this video, of course. You can go there to First Amendment Radio and listen to that. Um, it also is that way that Martin Luther, like all the other reformers, have had their faults. Like we all have our faults. And like a lot of people who come out of the Roman Catholic Church today, or come out of any other deceived church anyway, they still wear a little of that leaven, you know, of that deception that was taught to them all their life in their teachings today. And the reformers were no different of that. And I, I think that is absolutely normal. And we should never judge people on things like uh, these mistakes, because very often they do not do that intentionally. I am quite sure that Martin Luther, uh, with the faults that he still had in him, was not intentionally doing wrong, but he was just deceived through an indoctrination all his life before uh, being raised Roman Catholic, being raised a uh, Augustinian monk in the Roman Catholic Church. There are so many things so deeply indoctrinated into yourself that you sometimes you don't see the light through the, uh, the darkness that has blinded you to, to, to see the light, if, if, I may this, if I may make this little uh, announcement on there. And that's not only for Martin Luther. And that is an understanding that I have and that Tom from Inquisition Update has already since years, because some years ago, I don't know, I think it was in 2014 or so, I made a broadcast in Nothing But The Truth in the time with Michael Adams at that time, and uh, there were a few others on the call also, but among them was Tom Fress, and we did a three-hour broadcast, and uh, we called that one, uh, Why Didn't The Reformers Go All The Way? The Sabbath question, you know? Because that was one of the cruel points uh, that I always found with the reformers. Why did they keep the Sunday worship? Why didn't they go to the normal Christian sa seventh day Sabbath? And that has nothing to do with SDA because the Sabbath was ordained in creation week and there, were, there was no seventh day Adventist there. There was no Jew there. There was no Israelite there. There was just Adam and Eve. Yeah? And then the seventh day Sabbath was ordained by God. He made it holy. Okay? And he never took that away. He remembered the man to remember that in Exodus when he was speaking to the Israelites. That's right, but that doesn't make the Sabbath Israelitish or Jewish. It still makes him the final step of the creation. The signature wherewith God signed if I can call it that way, the picture that he painted six days long, he signed on the seventh day with the Sabbath. Okay? Now you can say, okay, the Sabbath is done away with, I don't keep the Sabbath, I don't care for that. You know? I am a true Bible believing Christian and I try to follow the law as good as I can. And I can't follow the law perfectly because nobody can, nobody could. There was only one who ever could do that, and that was Jesus Christ. That's why he was perfect, and that's why he was the perfect lamb, and that's why he could, with the spilling of his blood, take away the sins of the world, as it is written. Nobody else can do that. But I'm following the law in obedience to my Lord and Master. Not because I want to get saved, but because I am saved, I keep the law. Yeah? And the law can only condemn us. That's why grace is imputed into the real, true Bible-believing Christians. Grace, <coughs> grace takes away the condemnation of the law. But therefore you still have to strive to keep the law. Because if you say you love Christ but you don't keep his law, what kind of a love is that? When you don't respect him. 
when you don't show obedience to him. And the highest form of obedience is worship. And I worship my Lord and Master Jesus Christ and his Father in heaven. And my Father in heaven. Okay? We did a very, very interesting study on that yesterday in the Bible study on Ephesians chapter 1. It's one that's a book I would really love everybody to read. Ephesians chapter 1. Get the understanding of that. Wonderful, wonderful book. But to come back to the Martin Luther point here. Is I know that Martin Luther has had his faults. He has had his faults on the Sabbath question. Because I read somewhere, I cannot quote where exactly, I didn't keep that source, um, that when Martin Luther was asked why didn't he teach on the Sabbath, he said, I have my hands full with other things already, more than enough. I don't want to stir up any more quote-unquote confusion or whatever about the Sabbath question. And uh, in the Council of Trent that followed the publication of this book, which started, as you know, on the same day that Martin Luther published this book, on the 25th of March, 1545, in the 17th section, uh, the uh, Bishop of Reggio, or the Archbishop of Reggio, made a very profound statement, and that you can find in that video that I did in 2014, Nothing But The Truth, the Sabbath question, why didn't the reformers go all the way? Look that up in the archives of the playlist, Nothing But The Truth, you will find it, watch it, listen to it, and understand it. And this is just the Sabbath. Martin Luther also is still a quote-unquote proponent of child baptism, which is absolutely unbiblical. And here and there he has his little faults, but I don't judge him on this faults because I understand that when you are indoctrinated a whole life with all the lies, it is very hard to come out of there. Tom confesses that every time when we have a Bible study, he says, I was raised 50 years in a futurist church and I still have a little futurist leaven in me, probably somewhere. Well, I cannot, uh, <laughs> I cannot cur uh, that statement of Tom because I have never uh, seen any futurist leaven in him but the point is that when he says that he thinks that is that way who am I to argue huh? but uh, I don't think that there is a better teacher on futurism and historicism uh, in the place of futurism than Tom Fress I have never met anyone who can more eloquently and surely convince you of the faults of futurism Anyway, the point that I want to make is that even though Martin Luther has, his, has, his, has had his problems with some of the Roman Catholic doctrine probably still running through his veins even at the end of his life, he truly was a Bible-believing Christian, but here and there he had a wrong understanding, and that happens to everybody of us. You know, if anybody comes to me and says, I understand the Bible completely, I think that he is a liar. I don't think that anybody, any man in this world, can understand the Bible completely to its fullness. I think, therefore, you have to be another being but a fleshly sinner, wicked as we are all, all together. We all are. So anyway... I just wanted to say this a little bit as an introduction to this uh, 13th reading of the uh, against the Roman papacy and institution of the devil that you know a little bit the background why Tom and I came to read this book and how it is quote unquote coincidentally we do this at the same time you know once these videos are published it doesn't matter anymore and you have your choice to whether go to my readings and uh, watch them or to go to Tom's readings and watch them or even go to both and compare and that's what I even want to ask of you. You know, I am not in competition with Tom Fress. I think that I have my ministry and I do it my way and Tom has his ministry and he does it his way and we both do it in the way that the Holy Spirit leads us and the Holy Spirit does not lead two people, two ministries in the exact same way. Because everybody has to make his own emphasis. Everybody has to express himself in his own words. And I sometimes have problems expressing myself in my own words in the English language because that's not even my native language, but I do my very best to make to you understand why I am making this 15 minutes of introduction into the video, which should 
actually just be another reading of the book of Martin Luther. And we're going to start with that in a second, because we are coming today on page 335. I started... Uh, uh, I, I ended with the first paragraph and I have to start with the second paragraph on that page and I can tell you we are coming into a thing that I don't even think that I can uh, wrap up today let's have a look it's going on for at least two pages and this is one of the most wonderful things I have ever read in this book when I read this in German I just loved it and I'm going to love it in English too um, it is a wonderful book, and uh, Martin Luther speaks the way that he speaks. He doesn't cover his words. He's not sugarcoating anything. And here and there he uses maybe some harsh expressions, like last time when I read to you about what does the Pope say, and I said, but also lick your ass, as I said, even though in the book it says lick your behind, but you know, to me that's the same. Uh, these kind of expressions that Luther uses, I love him for that. And he is exactly writing what I am thinking. And here I have the possibility for once to say that. And because otherwise I'm not really cursing, but using these words is not cursing, but using these words is making a strong expression. Because maybe this way a lot of people will understand, finally. That's our hope. That's the hope of Tom Fress from Inquisition Update, that when you follow his reading and explanation of this book, Against the Roman Papacy and Institution of the Devil, written by Martin Luther in 1545, that you will finally come to the understanding that there is only one Antichrist in the world, and that is the office of the papacy. So there is not only one person, but there is one office, and that is the leading, the hierarchy, the vicar of Satan in this world, the Roman papacy, from the very first to the current to the very last pope who will ever be in this world. That papacy, and nothing else, is the Antichrist, the biblical, historical and prophetic Antichrist. And Tom Fress proves this, proves this with his explanation of this wonderful book against the Roman papacy and institution of the devil that he does on First Amendment Radio and Inquisition Update, and I do the same here on Hour of the Truth. And now, without any further ado, I want to continue and I will start on the second paragraph for the ones who, reading, who are reading along on page 335 on the second full paragraph of the page. That's at least where I should normally start, where I should continue. But I will retreat one paragraph, so I will start on the top of page 335. Well then... This has dealt briefly with the first damage the Pope has caused with his binding. And if you want to know what has dealt briefly with the first damage the Pope has caused with his binding, binding and loosing, his understanding of Matthew chapter 16 is this referring to, then go and retreat to at least one reading before this, number 12, that was called... Why don't they ask God's word and true preachers? <coughs> Where you can get the understanding of what we dealt with in the reading before. Of course, this one is building on that. So, Martin Luther continues, For who can recount everything that the devil, through the Pope, has been able to accomplish with the murder and betrayal of kings and emperors? They are temporal lords ordained by God as we know also from Romans 13. Why do they tolerate such things from such a rotten paunch, crude as Pope and fart as in Rome? Why don't they ask God's word and true preachers? But God's wrath has punished the world in this way. So I'm not going back into analyzing that little paragraph that I just read to you because I did that in the last reading. Now we're going to continue on the second paragraph on page 335. The second damage the devil has caused through the Pope's, no, through the devil's keys is much worse and much bigger for the worldly goods of all kingdoms are nothing in comparison with the spiritual eternal goods. 
something that we really have to understand. The worldly goods in the kingdom of Antichrist are nothing in comparison with the spiritual and eternal goods in the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. Here he has extended his binding or commanding into the spiritual realm in the name of all the devils so that it should mean establishing laws regarding the conscience of all of Christendom. As Mr. Nicholas Lord as Pope claims in Omnes he also has Jura Coelestis Imperii which means power to act in the kingdom of heaven. Yeah? So the Pope claims that he also has power to act in the kingdom of heaven because the Pope claims that he is the righteous vicar of Christ which is only the Holy Spirit in this world. When the Pope even claims that he is God on earth. Now therefore he claims he has Jura Coelestis Imperii power to act in the kingdom of heaven. And it is true to a certain extent. He does have a great deal to do in the heavenly kingdom. That is, in the church. And has accomplished much, just as his God, the devil, has too. For he has his work cut out for him. To break down and destroy all that Christ has built up and is still building. Thus, his God, the devil, had his work cut out for himself too, in the house of Job, when he slew all his children, servants and cattle, and tormented Job himself. His holy child, the Pope, the holy child of the devil, of Satan, the Pope, has just the same kind of work to do in Christ's kingdom. We shall now illustrate with some examples, and here we go, we dive into one of the most interesting parts of this book in a second. But before I go there, I of course want to make sure that you understand what I've just read to you. This is about the damage the devil has caused through the Pope, through his vicar, the vicar of Satan on earth, the papacy, and explaining that what he did here on earth is much worse than what he did in heaven. And Martin Luther even retracts to the book of Job because he says Satan had his work cut out for himself too in the house of Job. And we can read on that in the Bible. When Satan slew all of Job's children, all of Job's servants and cattle and tormented Job himself. Now the holy child of the devil the Pope, thereby Mr. Hellishness instead of Mr. Holiness, his quote-unquote holy child, the Satan's holy child, the Pope, has just the same kind of work to do in Christ's kingdom. We shall now illustrate with some examples. So what Satan did here on earth to Job the child of Satan, the Pope, is doing in Christ's kingdom, with it, which is the Church. And now we will see a list of things that the Pope does to the body of Christ here on earth. First, as heard above, the Lord wishes to have his Church built on himself. He is the rock, that is, he who wishes to be a Christian should believe in him in Jesus Christ. That is what the Lord wishes. No, says the ass Pope. It means that one should obey me, the Pope, and regard me, the Pope, as a Lord. Works like this save and disobedience or refusal to consider me, the Pope, a Lord, dance. Again. The Lord gives the whole of his sacrament to Christians. No, says the fart-ass Pope, one element is enough for the layman, 
the whole belongs to the priest. Unquote. Now, there are a few things that I want to go and address for a moment. First of all, Martin Luther speaks here about um, the Lord gives the whole of his sacraments to his Christians. The Lord does not give any sacrament, because sacrament is a Roman Catholic word. The Lord gives us the Lord's Supper, the Holy Communion. And that is an ordination, that is not a sacrament, because we are not made holy by this. Sacrament comes from sacred, comes from holy, right? You don't become holy because you participate in the Lord's Supper, because you participate in the Holy Communion. So this is not a sacrament, but this is one of the misunderstandings that Martin Luther has and that I want to address here, that you understand that even his choice of words in this case can lead you to a wrong tract. And that's not what we want. We want to have the truth. The Lord gives the whole of his ordination of the Holy Communion to his Christians. This is the way the sentence should be read from a Bible standpoint. But, of course, then the Pope replies, No, says the fart-ass Pope, one element is enough for the layman, the whole belongs to the priest. Well, in Bohemia at that time, a uh, hundred years before, we had had John Huss, who was invited to the uh, Council of Constance, which is uh, in, in southern Germany, Constance. And um, on that council, John Huss was, uh, or, or Jan Huss, uh, Jan was invited to come there, and he was promised a safe trip by the Emperor. And then the Emperor and the Pope turned on him and they executed him. And Jan Hus came from the Bohemians, and the Bohemians were, in the eyes of the Roman Catholic Church, schismatics, because they ordained the Holy Communion in both parts to everyone. Meaning, they break the bread and gave the bread in remembrance of Jesus Christ to the people who attended their services. And they gave also the cup with the wine to give to the people to share with the bread, the body, and with the wine, the blood of Jesus Christ in remembrance of him, as he said we should do in the Holy Bible. When Jesus said, here is this bread, take it and break it, this is my body, and here is the cup with the blood, and this is my blood shed for the new covenant. Take this bread, take this blood, and do this in remembrance of me. And do it with both. Do it with the bread, with the body, and do it with the wine, the blood. But the Roman Catholic Church withholds the holy full communion on every lay person. The Roman Catholic Church only gives out the bread. The wine is reserved for the priest. Now, what are the consequences of this? Well, first and for all, the consequences of this are terrible in that point of view, that of course you have to attend a Roman Catholic Mass, mass which is a sacrifice in itself, and there you are wrong in the very first place, of course. And second of all, you only receive half of the communion. You only receive the bread, you do not receive the wine. Why don't you receive the wine which stands for the blood? Because the blood stands for life, and the life is only given to the priests, not to the lay people in the Roman Catholic Church. That is something that we have to understand. And that is something the Roman Catholic Church does completely out of her own authority, because Jesus Christ ordained us to break the bread, that is his body, and do that in remembrance of him, and to take the cup and drink from the wine, that is the blood with which he seals the new covenant, and we have to do that in remembrance of him. And when you take both parts of the quote-unquote sacrament of this ordination of the Holy Communion, 
and you say and you are convinced and you confess that you do this in remembrance of Jesus Christ as he ordained us to do, the Roman Catholic Church speaks out an anathema against you. You are anathematized. You are cursed when you take the complete communion, when you take when you participate in both parts. So let us repeat this very last part in the book another time now that we have, I hope, the full understanding. The Lord gives the whole of his ordination, so I'm changing what is written in the book a little bit, to the biblical understanding. The Lord gives the whole of his ordination of the Holy Communion to his Christians. No, says the fart-ass Pope, one element is enough for the layman. The whole, both elements, belong to the priest only. Again, the Lord wants to have his sacrament given to strengthen for the poor um, to strengthen the poor consciences through faith. No, says Pope Fardas, one should sacrifice it for the dead and the living. Sell it and make a profitable business and market out of it, so that we can expand our belly with it and devour all of the world's goods. Unquote. This is what the Fardas Pope replies to this. So I'm not going to go any time that Martin Luther writes in this book about the quote-unquote sacrament. I'm not going every time into the explanation what I think about it. I did that already and I hope that you understand. And when I read this, you have to understand that with the understanding that I gave you before. There are no sacraments in the Bible. Those are ordinances the Lord gave us to keep in this case, the Holy Communion. Okay? I'm not every time changing the words written in this book. You have to understand that from the explanation that I gave you beforehand. I hope that we can agree on that. So I'm going to read it again. The Lord wants to have his sacrament given to strengthen the poor consciences through faith. No, says Pope Fardes, one should sacrifice it for the dead and the living. Sell it and make a profitable business and mark it out of it so that we can expand our belly with it and devour all of the world's goods. So, the Pope says, one should sacrifice it for the dead and the living. Jesus Christ never ever taught to do anything for the dead. Because the dead know nothing. Right? When one of his disciples wanted to bury his father first before he followed Jesus Christ, what did Jesus reply? Let the dead bury the dead. But the Pope is the vicar of Satan and Satan is the God of the dead as Jesus Christ is the God of the living. And therefore, in the Roman Catholic Satanic Synagogue of Satan Church, when you are keeping the quote-unquote sacraments, they should be sacrificed for the dead and the living. Because the living are doing this for the dead. That is the teaching of the devil. Now again, the Lord wills that whoever dies in the true faith shall certainly attain salvation. No, says the papal ass, one must first go to purgatory and atone for sin. For without works, the atonement for sin, which I bind or command, one must go into purgatory. Nobody but me, with keys and masses, can help there. Christ and faith can do nothing here, says the Pope. Shall we look at this to understand it again? 
the Lord wills that whoever dies in the true faith shall certainly attain salvation. What does that mean? That means that when you are a Bible-believing, Jesus Christ-following Christian, and you are saved through the grace of God, and you accept Jesus Christ's blood that was shed on the cross for the forgiveness of your sins, and you accept that He died on the cross and rose three days later, when you accept that, and when you live after that, as a true Bible-believing Christian, the Lord wills that you are sure of your salvation. The Lord wants you to know that you have assurance of everlasting life. But the Roman Catholic Church never ever gives you the certainty, the assurance that you really have been saved. There's always something more you have to do. There's more sacraments you have to follow. There is more sins that you have to confess. Even the forgotten sins, even sins you don't know you committed, you have to confess to your priest. I don't know how you can actually do that, but that's what the Roman Catholic Church demands. And even if you do all these things, you cannot be sure of everlasting life with the Lord in heaven, because you still have to go into, quote-unquote, purgatory, an invention of the Roman Catholic Church that has its roots in Babylon, in heathenism, in paganism. There you can never be sure of your salvation. That's the point. Trust in Jesus Christ and you can be sure of your salvation. Trust in the Pope and you can never be sure of your salvation. This is what this comes down to. Very, very important point to make that the Lord wills that whoever dies in the true faith shall certainly attain salvation. And the Pope says, no, one must first go to purgatory and atone for sin. And even when you go to purgatory, you cannot get yourself out of there. But the people who live and love you can pay money to the Roman Catholic Church, indulgences to get you out of purgatory. When you are watching this movie of Martin Luther, on which I put the picture in, in the beginning of this video, when Martin Luther went to Rome, I think it was in 1510, 1513, somewhere in that, in that time when he went to Rome, he bought an indulgence for a deceased, um, uh, for a deceased family member. I don't remember which one anymore, no, it's not important. And therefore, he was made, or he was given, quote unquote, the assurance that with his indulgence, the time in purgatory of that deceased family member will be shortened. Not that he is getting out of it, but that the time will be shortened. That's what the Roman Catholic Church sold all through the Middle Ages with their indulgences. Not only the forgiveness of the sins that you commit and committed, and will commit in the future, because you can buy an indulgence for every sin, past committed, now committed, or even planned in the future, depends on the amount of money that you are willing to pay to the Roman Catholic Church. So the point is, that through the selling of indulgences, you could also free relatives, friends, whatever, whoever, from purgatory, or at least shorten that time in purgatory. Tetzel, when he, when he went through Germany with selling his indulgences in the beginning of the 16th century, which actually set Martin Luther up to uh, publish his 95 Theses in 1517, which we know, when Tetzel came there, there was the saying, Sobald die Münze im Kasten klingt, die Seele in den Himmel springt which means in English, as soon as the coin hits the casket, 
the soul out of purgatory jumps. I don't have the, com the, 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 the right meaning, uh, the right translation now, but that's what it comes down to. As soon as the coin hits the ground in the, in the box, in the collection box of the purgatory money, as soon as the coin hits the bottom, the soul of the one you want to free from purgatory jumps out of purgatory. That's the teaching of Tetzel in that time. That's the teaching of the Roman Catholic Church concerning indulgences even until today. Because the Roman Catholic Church never changes. So when the Lord says that whoever dies in the true faith, when you have confessed Jesus Christ died for you on the cross, shed his blood for your sins, died and rose up three days later and sits now on the right hand of God, of his Father in heaven. When you die in, the, in this true faith, you shall certainly attain salvation. And the Pope says, no, one must first go to purgatory and atone for sin. For without work, what does the Bible say about works? The Bible says, through grace you are saved. Through faith and grace, and that's not of your own, not, uh, not of your works, lest that any man should boast. The Pope says, for without works, the atonement for sin, which I, the Pope, bind or command, yeah, the two keys again, one must go into purgatory. Nobody but me, the Pope, the vicar of Satan with the keys and the masses can help there. Christ and faith can do nothing here. Do you see how the Pope even contradicts himself? Christ can do nothing here, but he is the vicar of Christ, isn't he? Isn't that what he claims? So how can he, the vicar, do something that Christ himself cannot do? Well, only if the vicar of Christ is above Christ. Only if the God on earth, which he claims he is, stands above the God of heaven. That's the point that you have to understand. That's the point that you have to take out here. When the Pope says, nobody but me with keys and masses can help there, Christ and faith can do nothing here, the Pope stands with his authority, his self-proclaimed authority, Above God, above Jesus Christ, above faith, above God, above all. Well, isn't that what Lucifer announced in Isaiah 14? Again, the Lord wills that the efficacy of his baptism shall remain as often as we repent, as long as we live here. No, says the ass fart pope, the baptism is soon lost. That is why I have let it be preached that the holy monastic orders are to be considered as good, if not better, than baptism. Although I myself neither long for nor need such a baptism. Yeah? So the baptism is only temporal? temporarily for a short a certain specific period of time that is what the Pope claims whereas the Lord says that the efficacy of his baptism shall remain as often as we repent as long as we live here no says the ass fart Pope the baptism is soon lost that is why I the Pope have let it be preached that the holy monastic orders are to be considered as good, if not better than baptism. So that means that if you want to be even better than baptism, if you want to be more assured of your salvation, in the Roman Catholic Church of course, you have to enter a holy, quote-unquote, holy monastic order. You have to be part of a papal order, of a monastic order. Go into a convent like the nuns and the monks do. That's what the Pope says. When there, in the seclusion, which is never biblical, 
you can attain through that salvation. Although the Pope says, I myself neither long for nor need such a baptism. No, because the Pope is quote-unquote holy in itself, right? He doesn't need baptism. He doesn't need the quote-unquote holy monastic orders. No, because he ordained all that stuff. So he, of course, stands above all these rituals. Let's call them what they are. Rituals, traditions, and satanic orders. Again, the Lord wills that whoever confesses his sins and believes the absolution should be forgiven. No, says as Pope Fart, faith does nothing. But your own repentance and atonement do, as well as the recounting of all your secrets, forgotten and unrecognized sins. Unquote. Listen to that again. Faith does nothing, says the Pope, says the biblical, historical and prophetic Antichrist. Faith does nothing, but your own repentance and atonement do. So that's works. I have part in my salvation, according to the Antichrist. And Christ says that your salvation is by grace, and that's a gift, and not of your works. But your own repentance and atonement do, as well as the recounting of all your secret, forgotten, and unrecognized sins. How can I recount my secret, my forgotten and unrecognized sins. How can I recount unrecognized sins? If I don't know that I've sinned, how can I recount for that? Again, the Lord wills that according to faith and brotherly love, the customs of all creatures should be free and no sin or justification be looked for therein. Oh no, speaks the most hellish father, Christ is drunken, raving and mad. He has forgotten what great power he with the keys gave to me, the Pope, to bind. Namely, I have the authority to bind and to forbid that. Christ is drunken, raving and mad. He has forgotten what great power he with the keys gave to me to bind. Namely, I have the authority to bind and to forbid that. Whoever drinks milk on Friday, Saturday, on the eve of Apostles' Day, or of my Saints' Day, which I have made, is guilty of a deadly sin and eternal damnation, except that I am not bound to observe this. The Pope continues. Whoever drinks milk on Friday, Saturday, on the eve of Apostles' Day, or of my Saints' Day, Sunday, which I, the Pope, have made, is guilty of a deadly sin and eternal damnation, except that I am not bound to observe this. No, because the rules the Pope makes are not binding him. The one who has the keys to bind is not bound by the keys himself. That's what the Pope teaches. In other words, do as I say, don't do as I do. I make laws that you have to adhere to, but I do not adhere to these laws. I am standing above the law. That is the teaching of the Pope. And the teaching of the complete Roman Catholic hierarchy, of the cardinals, of the bishops, of the archbishops, of every deacon, of every priest in every parish, that's what they say. They are above the law. They are outside of the law. We make the law and everybody who does not adhere to this is 
guilty of deadly sin and eternal damnation, eternal purg purgatory, except that I, says the Pope, or the Cardinal, or the Bishop, or the Deacon, or the Priest, am not bound to observe this. I am accepted from the law. I make the law for others. I am not bound by the law. Whoever eats butter, cheese or eggs on those same days is guilty of a deadly sin and hell. This is why in the 16th and 15th century you could buy the so-called butterbriefe, butter letters. You could buy an indulgence that set you free from this quote-unquote deadly sin and hell and you could eat butter, cheese or eggs on every day of the week because you paid an indulgence for that. You bought yourself out of hell. That's satanic Roman Catholic teaching. Whoever eats butter, cheese or eggs on those same days is guilty of a deadly sin and hell. Another point, but I don't want to go too far into that, is why are we speaking about deadly sins? Every sin is deadly. Because sin is the transgression of the law and the, how does it say that in the Bible, the penalty for sin is death, right? So that's every sin, right? The Roman Catholic Church, of course, has a distinction between venial sins and deadly sins, sins and other sins, a distinction the Lord does not make. The Lord says clearly, here is the law, when you adhere to the law, everything is fine, when you don't adhere to the law, you are breaking the law, you are transgressing the law, and when you transgress the law, you are sinning, and the wages of sin is death. That's what the Bible teaches. But the Roman Catholic Church, of course, makes a distinction between different kinds of sins. Whoever eats meat on these days, however, is damned far more deeply than hell. Except me, the Pope, and my cardinals, who are not subject to such binding, because he who has the authority to bind will undoubtedly not bind himself, but others Bravo! Exactly what I said a few moments ago is now confirmed by the writing of Martin Luther in this book himself. I'm going to repeat this. Whoever eats meat on these days, this is of course something the Pope says, okay? Whoever eats meat on these days, Friday, Saturday, the Apostles' Day, or my Saints' Day, the Saints' Day of the Pope, Whoever eats meat on these days, however, is damned far more deeply than hell. Except me and my cardinals, me and the hierarchy or the magisterium, the magi of the Roman Catholic Church, who are not subject to such binding, because he who has the authority to bind will undoubtedly not bind himself, but others. Exactly what I said before. The people who make the law are not under the law, but they make the law for others. And it's the same in the temporal world. Didn't you ever ask yourself, why is your congressman blessed? <laughs> if you can use that word, <laughs> with diplomatic immunity. Hmm? In Germany, I know that everyone who is sitting in the Bundestag, who is one of the Abgeordneten, or one of the representatives of us, they have immunity. Why? Because the laws that they are making are not working for them. He who binds will undoubtedly not bind himself. Of course not. But he will bind others. That is the bondage that we are living under in the kingdom of Antichrist. 
And this is the bondage with which, with which Christ has made us free. Whoever does not fast and celebrate the saints I have created is guilty of a deadly sin and damnable disobedience. The reason for this is that I have authority to bind and loose. Perhaps even whoever does not worship my fart is guilty of a deadly sin and hell, for he does not acknowledge that I have the authority to bind and command everything. Whoever does not kiss my feet, and if I were to bind it so, lick my behind, is guilty of a deadly sin and deep hell, for Christ has given me the keys and authority to bind all and everything. Whatever king, emperor or prince does not hand over to me his kingdom and authority is guilty of a deadly sin and eternal damnation, for I have the authority to bind and command such things. Whatever bishop does not buy the pallium from me commits a deadly sin and is damned. The reason? I have the power to bind and to command such things. Whoever calls such a purchase, it is not robbery, it's a purchase, whoever calls such a purchase simony is guilty of a deadly and damnable sin, for it is I who should bind and loose. I think I should maybe go into a little bit of explanation of everything that I read here. But I hope that when you listen closely you will understand this very well. And we have come almost to an hour, so I'm going to repeat this probably next reading anyway, to go a little bit deeper into that. But we have to understand what the Pope farts here, as Martin Luther said, what the Pope says here, says, who so whoever does not fast and celebrate the saints I have created, are we to celebrate the saints biblically? Do we? Who are the saints in the Bible? The saints in the Bible are the Jesus Christ Bible believing Christians, holy people who adhere to the law of the Lord Jesus Christ, who accept the Lord Jesus Christ being crucified for us, being risen and being the first fruits of the resurrection and sitting at the right hand of God. Those are the saints, the born again Jesus Christ's commands following people. Those are the saints of the Bible. But the Pope here speaks Whoever does not fast and celebrate the saints I, the Pope, have created. So the Bible says you are a saint when you adhere to the law of God. And the Pope says you are a saint when I created you as a saint. When I had made you holy. When I beatified you. That's what the Pope says, in contradiction to what the Bible says. Whoever does not fast and celebrate the saints I, the Pope, have created, is guilty of a deadly sin and damnable disobedience. The reason for this is that I, the Pope, have authority to bind and loose. Perhaps even whoever does not worship my fart is guilty of a deadly sin and hell, for he does not acknowledge that I have the authority to bind and command everything. This is where we are ending today. The Pope stands on the standpoint that he is the one who has authority to bind and loose, as Jesus Christ said to the disciples, to the apostles, disciples at the time, whatever you bind and 
in earth shall be bound in heaven and whatever you lose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. The Pope says that he has the authority to bind and loose because he is the quote-unquote successor of Peter. He has been given the keys. He has been given the authority. Whoever does not worship my fart is guilty of a deadly sin and hell for he does not acknowledge that I have the authority to bind and command everything and if you do not acknowledge the authority of the Pope you are cursed, you are damned, you are sent to purgatory <laughs> and of course hell. And with analyzing the last few sentences that I've just read here, we will probably continue in the 14th reading, the next upcoming one, of this wonderful book Martin Luther wrote and published in 1545 against the Roman papacy and institution of the devil. I thank you for watching and listening and commenting, and until next time, Jogger 66 from Hour of the Truth, signing off, says God bless you and bye-bye.